to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In the days of Israel, God had made the promise to His people that if they would not stop their idolatry, He was going to send them away into Babylonian captivity. And in accord with His promises, God did just that. But He also promised to bring them out of that captivity into a wonderful restoration based on the Word of God. And friend, it's that restoration in Nehemiah chapter 8 that we're going to be thinking about today that parallels what's necessary for a Christian and his life to be restored to Almighty God. We want to encourage you to get your Bible, have it ready as we're going to open it to Nehemiah chapter 8, as we're going to study this wonderful text about the right heart that is necessary for restoration with Almighty God. Our lesson is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ, members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to drop by and visit them at their worship or a Bible study hour. They'd be happy to have you on Sunday or Wednesday. I promise you'll find people who love God, who are concerned about what the Scripture says, and are concerned about lost souls as well. Here at our work, the evangelistic work of the gospel of Christ, we want to help you also in your study of the Word of God. You can visit us at thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, all our media, whether it be written or in video or audio, is available free of charge. Most of it is available for a free download from the internet. If you'd like to have a hard copy, we have CDs and DVDs available. You can call us or write to us or email us at the information found on our website or at the end of this program. Let's turn our attention to the predicament that Israel finds itself in under the Old Testament. In Jeremiah chapter 25 and in Jeremiah 29, God had made the promise to His people that if they did not amend their ways, if they did not stop their idolatry, God was going to send them into 70 years of harsh captivity under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Israel didn't stop. And as a result, they went into harsh captivity. But along with the promise of captivity, God also made the promise in Isaiah 44 verse 28 and Isaiah 45 verse 1 that once that 70 years would up, was up, God would bring His people out of that captivity. And in accord with His promise by the hand of Cyrus in the year 536, God did just that. And it is this process of coming back to God, begun with Cyrus, working through Ezra and Nehemiah. They restore worship, they restore the temple, and they restore their hearts to a right place with God. And found in Nehemiah chapter 8, where we're going to be studying today, there are some ingredients or some steps that are necessary to getting our heart right and to be restored with God like we ought to. And so we ask you to think about your relationship, each of us, to think about our relationship with God and let's make sure that we're in the right place, that we're restored to where we need to be with Almighty God. And if not, let's consider what this text teaches us is necessary. Look in your Bible in Nehemiah chapter 8, and I want you to notice what he says in verse number 1. When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Here you've got uh, such an important and necessary step if we're going to have restoration. That is, I've got to want 
to be united with God and His people, to have a restored heart to God. Friend, you've got to be one. You've got to be unified and you've got to want unity with God and His people. You see, this is so practical and so fresh on the mind of the Israelites because for years they had been divided over spiritual matters. The kingdoms had been divided, the northern kingdom and its tribes and the southern kingdom and its tribes. And then you have a remnant who's holding true to the scripture. Then you've got an idolatrous, a whole bunch of idolatrous people. They've been splintered and divided for a long time. And yet the captivity helped them to realize they needed to be one with each other and one with God. Friend, if restoration is really going to take place, God's people, uh, we must have a heart for unity. We must want that oneness with others and that oneness that God can give us, that unity that we can have with God. You see, in the Bible, God has always wanted His people to have unity. Uh, listen to Psalm 133. Verse number one, the psalmist says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Does God want His people divided? No. God wants His people united. Did you think about the two words there that are used? Unity is both good and pleasant. You know, there are some things that are good but aren't pleasant, and then there are some things that are pleasant but aren't good. Let me illustrate. There are some things that are good, meaning that they're good for you. Going to the doctor's good. Getting a flu shot might be good, but would you say that's pleasant? No, not really. And then there are some things that are pleasant, enjoyable, but not necessarily beneficial. Candy for every meal. A, a, a chocolate pie every meal might be pretty pleasant. But is it good for you? No. Now think about unity. Unity is good, beneficial, healthful, and it's pleasant. It's enjoyable. It's something every person ought to strive for in this life. Uh, we're told in Ephesians 4 verse 3, to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, spiritual unity, and the bond of peace. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, Paul came down hard on the church in Corinth because there were divisions among them. And Paul said, let there be no divisions among you. And someone says, okay, that's all good and well, but what's so powerful about unity? Friend, do we realize that there's great strength in unity? I want you to listen to a passage in the book of Ecclesiastes that helps us to understand this idea. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, listen to what the Bible says in verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. He has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know, I can understand the strength in unity based off these principles and these ideas here and in other ways. Uh, think about it this way. If you take just one pencil, pretty easy to break that one pencil. But if you take that pencil and you multiply it, and let's say you had 10 pencils with a rubber band around it. It'd be hard to break that. Why? There's strength and there's power in unity. There's strength in numbers and that unity creates strength. We can encourage, we can uplift, we can help one another. But you know another powerful aspect of unity is unity actually proves to the world that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus prayed for it in John 17, verses 20 and 21. I pray that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Now listen to the reason. That the world may believe that you sent me. What does unity express? Unity between believers in Christ, Christians, is a powerful exclamation point to Christianity itself. It proves to the world 
we'll stand up and do what's right no matter what because Christ is truly our all in all. And thus, when we think about being, having biblical restoration and the idea therein of being restored to God correctly, friend, we've got to be diligent to strive to possess spiritual unity. That comes from following the oneness that God has set in the Scripture. One Lord, one faith, one body, one baptism, one God and Father above all. All the ones that are mentioned in Ephesians 4 verses 4 through 6 are necessary if we're going to have unity like God wants us to in the Scripture. But then I want to direct your attention to another ingredient that is necessary for biblical restoration and that's found in Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 2 and 3. I want you to notice what the Bible tells us in Nehemiah chapter 8. Listen to verses 2 and 3 about what was necessary for restoration then and now. Scripture records this. Nehemiah 8 verse 2, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and the women and those who could understand. Now listen to this. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Friend, what ingredient is necessary for biblical restoration to take place? There has to be a desire for unity. Unity with God's creation and unity with God. But friend, there also has to be an attentive heart to the law of God. They told Ezra, go get the book of the law. Ezra went and got the book of the law. He stood and read from it nearly all day and the people stood there with an attentive heart, attentive ear, and they listened to the Word of God. Not what was public opinion, not what was popular, not what would make people feel good. They didn't poll the audience and ask them what they wanted. They said, where's the book of God? We want to hear the book of God. When they found the book of the law, they, their ears perked up and they listened to what God had to say. They had an attentive heart to the Word of God. Friend, the Israelites, they were so attentive to the Word of God because they had lacked that for so long. In that captivity, that 70 years of harsh Babylonian captivity, where were the Bibles then? Where was the Scripture then? Where was their freedom to open the Scripture and study it and expound upon it and read from it? Under captivity, that was a scarce thing. Because of the lack of their ability to have God's Word in their life for so long. Friend, they were ready to listen to the Scripture. The only way today that we're going to have a real attitude of attentiveness to the Word of God is when we realize the great value of God's Word. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15 verse 16, Your words were found and I did eat them. And they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Part of the problem that we face today in our uh, industrialized world with printing presses and books everywhere is that there is a, there's mass availability to the Bible. And yet we take for granted how powerful it is and how attentive we need to be to it. It's readily available. I've got the freedom to read it anytime I want. And yet so many times, we just don't. Do we take it for granted what a treasure and privilege it is? You see, the Word of God, it's so important because it's what saves our souls. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse number 21, that we're to receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save our soul. What's going to save men and women from being lost for eternity? The Scripture is. And so let's think for just a few moments about how powerful and how important and how attentive we need to be to the Word of God because of its great value. Friend, do we realize and do we remember that the Bible contains the words of life? Not just words of life, the words of life. That which can help us to be saved and live the best life. 
Jesus had made some hard statements in John chapter 6, verse 63 following. Some decided they didn't want to follow Jesus anymore. Jesus turned to Peter and the rest of the disciples and he said, Do you want to go away also? Here's your chance. Do you want to go away also? Peter turned to the Lord and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John chapter 6, verse 68. The Bible has everything, all things for life and godliness. The Word of God is able to completely equip us for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, verse 17. If you want to live the best life, you want to make sure that you're living in such a way you can go to heaven, you want to live the full, complete, abundant life. For in the Bible contains the words of life. The Bible has the ability to edify us, to build us up and help us to be closer to God to the elders in Ephesus, whom Paul will very likely never see again. Paul on the beach of Miletus says this, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You want to be built up spiritually? You want to make sure that an inheritance is yours and that you can grab hold of it and maintain it? Well, friend, it's the Bible that has the power to do that. We need an attentive heart to the Word of God because it's God's Word that helps us be convicted when we have sin in our life. For all honest, none of us probably like to admit that or come face to face with it, but it's true. From time to time, we all sin and fall short. You know a great value of the Bible is? It helps us to realize that and to get that out of our life. Acts 2 verse 36, the Bible says, Peter stood up and proclaimed, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God's made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says those Jews who heard that and were attentive to it, they were cut to the heart. What's that mean? The Bible pricked their heart and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Saul of Tarsus, who had gotten hardened, by his zealous Jewish upbringing is softened by the Word of God. Acts chapter 9, Saul is intent on uh, dragging men and women to prison, persecuting them. Some of them might even die. And he's presented with Jesus on the way to Damascus. Lord, when he realizes his truth, his ears perk up. Lord, what would you have me to do? God's Word is able to help us overcome sin. Your word, the psalmist said, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12. If I've got a good work and knowledge of the word of God and my heart's attentive to that, when, my fi when I find my ways aren't what they ought to be, friend, it encourages me and I want to get back right with Almighty God. And then, of course, the Bible has the power to help us realize why we're here, where we're going, and where we'll end up. You know, we realize I'm here as a creation of God. Genesis 1 verse 26, Genesis 2 verse 7, I'm not going to be here real long. Life is but a vapor. James 4 verse 14, 70, maybe 80 years. Psalm 90 verses 10 through 12, and one day I will stand before Almighty God. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and I'll give an account of how I live my life. It's about pointed a man wants to die and then the judgment. And friend, if I've listened to the Word of God and I've lived my life by that, on that great day, I'll hear those wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant. If I haven't, if I've turned a deaf ear to the Word of God, then I'll hear the words, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And so I want to have a, a mindset that desires unity with God and others. I want to have an attentive heart to God and His Word. And then a third ingredient that is necessary for biblical restoration is I need great respect in my life for the Word and the authority of Almighty God. Look in Nehemiah chapter 8. And I want you to notice what the Scripture records happens in verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for that purpose, and beside him at his right hand stood Mattatiah, Shema, Ananiah, Urijah, Hilkiah, Messiah, and at his left hand Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshullam. 
And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. Now watch this. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Why did all the people, st here's Ezra, he's up on a, a platform, a podium we might think of. He's up on an elevated area, and Ezra takes the book of God in front of all these people, and when he opens that book, being up above them, everybody stands up. Why? Friends, after 70 years of harsh captivity, it finally dawned upon the Israelites how powerful and how much they needed to respect the Bible, and as that voice of God is open before them, they stand up out of honor and respect for the Word of God. Friend, we need today that same respect for God and His Word. Do we realize that this book is the very voice of God speaking to us today? All Scripture is breathed out by God. 2 Timothy 3.16, that the, the pages in this book are not just ink and paper, that this is God's message for me. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and God told, tells me in this book how He wants me to live. You know, this is how we please God. And out of respect for Almighty God, I want to respect the scriptures. I want to realize this is God's Word and I've got to live in harmony in such a way with it that one day I can bring honor and glory to Almighty God in every way and in every occasion. And so we think about God and we think about God's message and, and how to please Him and how to give glory and honor to Him in each and every way. And that's what, that's what this is all about in every avenue and in every way. All right then, in verse number 6, as we think about this idea in Nehemiah chapter 8, I want to give us then another principle that will help us. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen. While lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. What's necessary for biblical restoration from Nehemiah 8 verse 6? Friend, there has to be absolute uh, worship for God with fear and reverence. Look at the people. They, they bow down. The act of bowing one's face to the ground was a, a sign of reverence and fear and awe of Almighty God. Exodus 3 verse 5, as Moses is there at that burning bush, he bows down with his face toward the ground. Isaiah 6, Isaiah feels humbled to be in the presence of God. And then, of course, you have John in the book of Revelation. All of these exhibit this idea of one's face going down, representative of reverence or fear for Almighty God in worship. Friend, if we're going to have biblical restoration, it's got to be based on respect for who God is and how God wants me to worship Him. You know, there's a, there's a lot of seeming uh, disrespect for God and worship today. When you look at some of the things that are done today, You've got so much that is, makes light of uh, what's going on. The, the, the people who are jumping around and hollering and, and hooping and hollering and jumping over pews and, and all this supposed miraculous stuff that's going on that people are just trying to make a big show out of. It's almost like a carnival or a circus as it were today. Friend, we need to realize God wants us to worship Him in a way that brings glory and honor to His name and out of respect for Him, not me, out of respect for God, I want to worship Him the way He wants me to. God is a spirit. Here's what He says. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so our attitude and the way we approach God must give Him true honor and glory. And then a final ingredient that is necessary for biblical restoration is we've got to come to the Scripture and try to understand what God wants us to based on His Word, a proper hermeneutic or understanding of God based on the Bible. Listen to Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achab, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, 
Hannah and Peliah and the Levites helped the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God and they gave the sense of the understanding and helped them to understand the reading. Here you've got people who've studied the scripture a long time. And so some of these people haven't for many years studied the Bible. And so what did they do to really understand the Scripture? Did they get out commentaries and give everybody's idea and take an opinion poll? No. They read distinctly to them from the Bible. Friend, if we really want to have biblical restoration, let's turn people back to the Word of God. Let's turn people toward the Scriptures. Let's read God's Word. If Paul said in Ephesians 3 verse 4, you can understand my mystery and the knowledge of Christ when you've read these things. Give attention to reading. Paul said in 1 Timothy 4 verse 13. And then we want to point people to the Bible to help understand it. If I want to understand the Bible, I want to let the Bible be its own best commentary. And then of course I want to apply God's message to my life. The things which you've heard and read and seen, Paul said, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Too many times people are turned toward entertainment, turned toward what somebody somewhere who is a religious uh, person says, my pastor says this, or our priest says this, or Father so-and-so says this. Hey, let's turn people to the Bible. Is there any word? from the Lord. Jeremiah 37 verse 17. That's how we're really going to be restored to Almighty God. And so just like in the days of Nehemiah, how wonderful it was that they had the opportunity to get back right with God. That's in Nehemiah 8 is such an encouraging scene because the people, regardless of persecution or what it takes, they're going to put God, they're going to put His Word, and they're going to put worshiping Him above all else how we need that same attitude among the Lord's people today. May God help each of us to have the right heart for unity, to look to the Word of God and be attentive and respectful for what God wants so that one day He'll call upon us as His children with words of encouragement and hope. Well done, good and faithful servant. May God help each of us to live in that way. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.